we have somebody else coming here. Maybe. Maybe. Morning. 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 Right. We're going to pick up where we left off here in that paragraph of verses 8 through 15 in uh, 1 Timothy <clears throat> chapter 2. Now, Lord, do. See, will you lead us in a prayer, please? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for everything that you give us each and every day. We thank you for each person in this room. We thank you for John and uh, what he's prepared today. Help us to uh, just follow along the best way we can and grab on to everything he has to say. Thank you for everything you give us. Just let me pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Last week we talked about uh, Paul's written to Timothy here about uh, men praying everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Talked about uh, how the women should uh, should attire themselves, what they should wear, what they should not wear. Make sure it's uh, with propriety. <coughs> he talked about the women being silent, not total silence, or else they couldn't, uh, uh, they wouldn't be able to sing. Now, Carrie, down in South Louisiana, whole different culture. I remember the preacher down here at Greenfield, R.L. Burgess, saying, I don't see the problem if a woman ever says amen. Or whatever, because she's not usurping authority. Um, when it got down to Louisiana, women will say amen and praise the Lord and hallelujah in the sermon. Kind of caught me off guard the first time I heard it. Um, but to let the woman learn in silence with all submission, neither not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Um, it could be like this lady at Bastard Lake. She put amen on her fan and held it up. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. That's one way of getting around it. Yeah. Amen on the fan and hold it up. Uh, you keep in mind the context here. Paul referring to the public assembly. Otherwise, if, if a woman is not to teach you to have authority over a man then how could a wife ever teach her husband if that need be the case? Better do it at home, not in the service. So, right, that, that's what I'm saying. It's important to keep in mind Paul makes <coughs> reference to the, uh, uh, to the public assemblies here. And his, his reasoning is very simple because Adam was formed first and then Eve. And then it wasn't Adam that was deceived, but it was Eve who was deceived. I don't, I can't explain how he said it, or why he said that, uh, but there's Paul's reasons for that. All right. Nevertheless, you will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, with self-control. All right. Let me just read to you what J. Burton Kaufman says about being saved in childbearing. Kaufman says, all kinds of fanciful interpretations of this verse have been advocated. But in all probability, childbearing is a synecdoche for the entire status of women in their relationship to God and men. He says another commentator uh, or another scholar says that he, Dumelow, was correct in seeing the meaning thus. The woman shall be saved by keeping simply and faithfully to her allotted sphere as wife and mother. There is no reference to the birth of Christ nor to any promise of salvation based solely upon the biological function of of childbearing. So being the wife and the mother of the home, uh, <clears throat> my aunt, my grandmother's sister, said something one day that really, really made me angry. Uh, right after, or right before me and Karen got married, uh, Karen stayed at home keeping two kids for different people. So, so she was a nanny, I guess you could say. And my aunt asked me, well, does she work? Or, or where does she work? I said, well, she stays at home and keeps kids. She said, oh, she just doesn't want to work then. And I'm like, did you really just say that? Didn't you have like six kids of your own? And care if I called her name, you'd know her. Um, <clears throat> it, but I, that just floored me. This, well, she just doesn't want to work then. Um, That's work. Staying at home is work. That's one reason I go to That's work. So I don't have to stay at home at work. Home. Yeah. yeah. I learned that a long time ago in the business world. You know, you talk with people about their finances and 
about buying a home and you talk with a man, he works at so and so, and then you know, you might say to the woman, Do you work? You know, but we learned a long time ago, you say, Do you work outside of the home? Yeah, so definitely. That, that allows her to say, No, I just work at home, okay? You know? I just work at home, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah that's uh, to say a woman doesn't work even as a housewife is mm -hmm. well, not right. What you see here, I think, is the uh, uh, the order and orderliness of God <clears throat> he created man first he could have created a woman you know he created a man and and then you know you see the pattern there the patriarchal age you know where the man was the head of the household and made decisions for the, mm -hmm. for the family and so on but that doesn't make a woman <clears throat> inferior uh, because of that uh, I don't feel at all but it also uh, uh, just defines her role here and, and man's role and there are different roles, they have different um, characteristics and everything else, and they look different and they are different, uh, the way they analyze things and all that. So uh, they have their role and God knew all about it. He made both, so uh, you know, he ought to be the one to say who has this certain area to work in, who has this area to, to be concerned about. That's the whole idea of being a help meet for him. Yeah. yeah. To come. Complement him. That's with an E, not an I. Yeah. Uh, but it makes it complete too. You know, you take any component and you jerk one thing out of it, but it may not work right at all. Then you know, you broke a circuit or something in there, where you take, you know, uh, the other one, put it back in, or take the other one out, and then it still ain't gonna work right because you've got some component out of it. So it's a, uh, you say a complement to each other or a. Um, connectivity of the system to make it work correctly. Mm -hmm. But there's a certain order about things. You've got a head main breaker and then you've got other <coughs> breakers underneath it in a panel box, for instance, you know. And I heard a guy said when we were up at State Line, the, uh, one guy's wife went to the beach or something or another for a week with her kids or whatever. And uh, said like a Sunday morning Bible class, he said something about it. Go ahead, I'm just going to correct some. Did I spell you, it wrong? You and Tim went to the same, I think. I, I might be wrong. What about that? I won't make an eye of this. Is that anybody else go wrong? No, sir, that's wrong. That is, that is. I like that tie. Compliment. That's, I like that tie. Complete, complement. That's kind of the concept. Yep. He's trying to This is husband and wife make a good team. There you go. Two totally different words. Okay, I wanted to make that point to y'all. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, um, I don't know if I'm trying to tell. <laughs> State line, beach. Say what? State, State line, line, beach. That's the last thing you said. State line, oh, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, this guy at State Line, his wife went to the beach with her kids and grandkids, and he said something to the effect, well, I had to get up and find my own clothes this morning. And, and yeah, he, he, he said, I never thought about everything that Gene does at home, and washing clothes and washing dishes and laying my clothes out and making sure they match. He said, I never thought about that until she was gone that week. <clears throat> That's all part of this, complimenting each other. All right. The and we Carrie, we could spend weeks on the woman's role and how important it is. Um, talking about in childbearing, I remember down at Lincoln, uh, teenager down at Lincoln. My dad didn't really complain, but he said something about all these babies crying in worship service. He said we can't. Uh, can't pay attention. Why can't they, the mothers take them out? Well, the next week, it just so happens that the associate minister, Dan Webb, he wrote an article. Uh, and he, the gist of his article was uh, one of the purest and most beautiful noises, sounds you'll ever hear, is that of a baby crying. And you know what my dad said to that? He said, he wrote that in response to my complaint. He said, I never thought about that. And he never complained about crying babies in service again. Um, 
read an article about a woman who <clears throat> said that, you know, with her being at services by herself without her husband, I don't know if she was uh, widowed or whatever, but she had a small child and she was forever making him be still and be quiet and having to take him out and discipline him. She said, I don't ever get anything out of service. Well, the preacher's response to that was, you're getting more out of this service than a lot of people in here. Simply because you're here and doing this part right here, saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and self-control. All right, moving on to chapter 3, the qualification of the elders <coughs> and the deacons, verses 1 through 7. This is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. And moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. That word desire means to reach out for something, something that you really want to do. Uh, the Greek word <clears throat> means to stretch oneself out in order to touch or grasp something. To reach after or desire something. Um, I think Peter mentions in the being qualified to be an elder uh, that he should not serve by anybody know the word compulsion. Compulsion. Um, he shouldn't be guilted into serving in that capacity. He shouldn't be forced or have his arm twisted into serving it. Um, <clears throat> so, so Paul points out, if, if he desires it, he desired a good work. Well, what if he doesn't desire it? Then again, you go back to what Peter said, he shouldn't serve by compulsion. Um, he must be blameless, and by being blameless, nobody can say anything against him truthfully. Now, Carrie, is there anybody who doesn't like you? I'm probably last to one or two out there. Probably one or two, yeah. Um, you always got some people that, you know, uh, I guess have an end for you one way or another a little bit, but uh, I think there's <clears> a general sense, consensus there about what people might say or think about somebody, you know, it's and that tends to precede you a lot of times more than you realize. Uh, um, and uh, unfortunately, it can be uh, almost passed down one way or another a little bit. You know, you have a, for a while, you know, if you had your, your dad that was pretty, uh, pretty rough character or something, you know, and they kind of almost, without knowing you, want to cast a shadow. Yep. on you a little bit <clears throat> and it, it can work in different lights you know my dad I had a good reputation and I kind of got a shadow cast over me a little bit there in that regard in a favorable light at least till I had a chance to prove myself one way or another you know mm -hmm. what I was to them but you're not going to like say please everybody but uh, your general reputation is something that should be fairly well discovered or known and um that's, I think, what he's getting at here. Hey, uh, there's a... <clears throat> somebody put on the Facebook this week on the Buckhorn Area Community Board. They're looking for recommendations. Somebody installed hardwood floors. And there's several people listed there, and I put my name there. And uh, the next comment under mine, the lady said, don't hire John Grantham. What? And uh, she said... She said, he gave me an estimate to paint my house this year, and he was way out of the ballpark. He said, I got other estimates for thousands less than he said. And after I thought about it for a few minutes, I responded. I said, I, said, I, I sincerely hope 
you found somebody to fit your budget. And I hope they did what we said we would do. And I gave the list of what we said we'd do so she could compare apples to apples. And I told her, I said, I said, we don't, we don't use cheap tools. We don't use cheap paint and our labor is not cheap. And I said, have a blessed night. And, uh, then some, some of my other customers chimed in, chimed in, and even some non-customers chimed in. Well, the next day that lady deleted her post. And it's not like I went over there and did sloppy work for too much money. She never called us back. We didn't even work for her. Um, well, we were trying to tell her he was too busy and didn't need her job right then. <laughs> That's what they always say when they've been high. He must be busy right now. So. Yeah. Uh, just didn't, couldn't take it home unless it's going to be a good money involved. And, and what should have made me mad, it didn't really even make me mad. It, uh, I would like to know why she put it on there, though. John, that was my fake uh, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was yours? <laughs> no, no. Well, I'll tell you what. You sure look a whole lot different than the day I met you back last July. <clears throat> whole lot different. All right. Be blameless the husband of one wife. Here is a fundamental reason why a woman can't serve as an elder. Because you got to be the husband of one wife. Um, now, our culture today says this is old-fashioned. This is old-fashioned. Will there ever be a day in Maysville Church of Christ future where the preacher will have a husband? And that's answered with an emphatic no. 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 Absolutely no. Absolutely not. Um, <clears throat> husband of one wife. Temperate. Temperate means he's not given to alcohol. He's not going to uh, drink. Um, the the way the word tempered is used, it, it, it seems like if he had a little bit, it'd be all right. But the idea behind it is none. Now, later on, uh, is it this passage or... I think in Paul's letter to Titus, uh, Paul writes, not given to much wine. So, and we'll talk about that a little later. Um, temperate sober-minded, uh, of good behavior, hospitable, and, and these words basically mean what, what we're reading right now. Able to teach. The, the King James says apt to teach, not just able to teach. But, uh, <clears throat> but I looked up that word apt in, in the Greek, and it means basically skillful in teaching. So that he is able to teach, just like New King James reads. And uh, I looked up, uh, it's called a, basically a King James Dictionary. Uh, not, not, a, uh, not a lexicon with the meaning of the Greek words, but a King James Dictionary to show us the definition of the words that were used in 1611. The word apt, according to this King James Dictionary, uh, five definitions for it. Uh, it means fit, suitable, uh, it means having a tendency, liable, it means inclined, uh, disposed customarily, uh, use of persons, it means ready and quick, and it means qualified and fit. So it's, it's not just being able to teach, uh, but having the tendency to teach, being inclined to teach. And whenever I've read this, this verse in the past, able to teach, I'm thinking standing in front of a group of people. Well, that's not everything. Not everybody can stand in front of a group of people and teach. And I don't think that's what Paul's talking about. Uh, because a public setting is not the only place where teaching is done. It can be done in private. Uh, you can teach without even knowing it uh, in, in the example that you put forth. All right, in verse 3, now back in verse 2 he said be temperate. It means not given to alcohol. Well, verse 3 blatantly says not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. That not used one, two, three, four, five times. 
uh, expresses absolute denial. Absolute denial. So there's not going to be any alcohol. He's not going to have angry, uh, angry outbursts. He's not going to take your money for at whatever expense. Uh, he's not going to argue, and he doesn't covet what you have. These are some. These are qualifications used to define who and what an elder is. Now, I've heard some people say this is not a litmus test where you check off everything on there, and I've heard other people say, oh, yes, it is. Um, but which of these which of these qualifications for elder would not also apply to, the, I hate to use the word regular, but the regular church member? Should, 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 Anybody who's not an elder or a deacon or preacher or Bible class teacher, is there anybody in, in, in this church who should not be blameless or tempered or sober-minded, good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous? Is there anybody who shouldn't have that? Other Everybody, should. Everybody should. So, it's time to think about it. Carrie, when everybody gets older than you are, all the men, they should serve as elders. <laughs> Yeah, maybe so. Uh, you know, it's um, um, nobody's perfect. You know, we talk about being blameless while ago. Everybody got faults, uh, but nevertheless, there's a, a tendency to be certain ways and in the direction of your life. I know uh, you've seen a lot of different elders where you've worshipped, and I have too. You know, and uh, they all come with different personalities. You know, even though they're all maybe wrapped mm -hmm. up with some of the same traits, supposedly. Um, but, um, you know, uh, and, and it'd be interesting to see sometimes if you poll memberships, what what do you think is the most important thing an elder trait ought to be? You know, if you started trying to put one of these number one, one number two, one number three, mm -hmm. now they're all important or God wouldn't have them put in here. But, right. Um, you get different responses, you know. Some people like the fact, well, you know, I like them to be able to get up and teach, teach classes or teach, teach. That's really important. Or I want them to be able to be um, sociable with me and hospitable and you know approachable and all that. Uh, I know my brother, brother Milan, one of the elders at Memorial Park four years ago. He was very, um, very humble, and very uh, approachable man, and he was an elder over there. I respected him quite a bit, and Brother Kenny over there is now. I feel uh, his same character. I like like associating with him and see him occasionally out. Uh, but uh, you know, they're different personalities, but they all have those underlying <coughs> uh, attributes that should be there that um, drive them to hopefully make good decisions. You know, about somebody else rather than himself all the time. And this has to do with selfishness a lot of it if you get to looking at it closer and uh, so the more they're interested in, in helping other people and serving to help their needs then you know they get closer to I think what he's describing the uh, number one qualification for an elder if you, if you ask me for my opinion for whatever it's worth is not even listed here uh, from Matthew twenty two thirty seven, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's first, and that should be first with everybody. And then, when you do that, he said, "This is Jesus said, this is the first and great com great commandment, and second like it, you should love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets." Well, you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Guess what? Everything else just kind of falls in place. It's not like you, you got to start getting these different things in order because they're going to come in order if you do like Jesus said here. So so if you were to ask me that, that would be my first qualification for elder, deacon, teacher, whoever, or, or whatever. Uh, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. All right. Here we go. Look over Titus chapter 1, verse 6. 
And this is Paul's letter to Titus with qualifications for elders. And he says a little bit, a little differently here. Titus 1 verse 6. <clears throat> if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. For bishop must be blameless, steward of God. That verse 6, having faithful children. All right. Here we go. I don't mean to open the can of worms, but Carrie, I kind of answered the question that you and I have talked about before. Mm -hmm. And here, here we go with it. A lot of people, I have known people who, older men who otherwise would be qualified to serve as elders, except their adult children were not faithful. Um, and that was of their own opinion. I can't serve because my children are not faithful. <clears throat> well, if we let Scripture interpret Scripture, the reason they would give that come Titus one, from Titus 1.6 that you must have faithful children, if we let Scripture interpret Scripture and come back here and look at Paul's letter to Timothy, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. It's the children still living in his house. How is anybody, including you, Carrie, going to rule the house of your child. I mean, is it up to you, and I'm picking on you for a purpose, right. is it up to you to rule Michael's house? No, it's not my responsibility. As an adult, he has his own house to rule. Okay, you know. and and that's where, uh, that, this is a good example to let interp uh, Scripture interpret Scripture, uh, where Paul tells Titus that his children must be faithful now, if, if Michael's still living at home under your roof and he's 17 years old, that's a different story. But Michael is not under his roof anymore. <clears throat> and I like Paul's reasoning for this in a parenthetical statement, verse 5, For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? So you know what? It sounds like a man and his wife and his children, this man is spending his whole life being trained to take care of the family of God. Not a novice, not somebody who's new, or else he will be puffed up with pride and fall into the same condemnation as the devil. What happened uh, with a young person who's, who comes into a lot of power? They get the big head sometimes. That's exactly what Paul's talking about here. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into approach and the snare of the devil. Uh, I find it interesting that Paul specified this outside because uh, back in verse 2 he said a bishop must be blameless. Well, is that just among people in the church? And then he clarifies something. He's got to have a good testimony. He's still got to be blameless among people who are not Christians. All right. From uh, 8 through 13, looking at the qualifications of the deacons. I'm looking forward to Tim's sermon this morning on, on this. <clears throat> Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience, but let these also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. That deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, this word deacon... Uh, see an example of that back in Acts chapter 6 verses 1 through 7 although Luke never uses the word deacon there in that passage but we see the, the, the difference between the elder and the deacon the elder being responsible for the spiritual nature of the church and the deacon responsible for the physical nature of the church taking care of the tables as Luke said in Acts chapter 6 um, not 
double tongued. Uh, and, and the Greek word for this goes to the idea of uh, telling a different story, uh, saying the same thing twice, repeating double tongued, uh, saying one thing with one person and another thing with another person, or otherwise, other words, with the intent to deceive. Now, uh, Proverbs 20, verse 19 Solomon wrote, He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets, and therefore do not associate with one who flatters with his lips. And in Galatians 2 and 13, Paul said, in, in talk, making reference to when Peter played the, uh, Peter played the part of the hypocrite, uh, Paul says, And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, that is with Peter, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. So there's an example of an apostle even being double tongued, and that, that's a whole whole different story. But uh, but it's there. Not giving too much wine. Does this mean that he can drink a little bit? The elder can't drink anything. But he says not giving too much wine. They can, can drink a little bit. I don't think that's the implication. That's how it reads. But that's not what Paul means there. Can't be greedy for money, just like the elder is. Uh, if he's greedy for money, then his office of collecting and distributing alms would would render this a no. The deacon's office of collecting and distributing alms would render this a necessary qualification, not greedy for money. Um, who was it that handled the the money box for the disciples with Jesus? Judas. What was what was Judas's one fault? He liked to keep some of it. In other words, he was lover of money. He was a lover of money. He was greedy. Whatever it took. Um, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. The, uh, Romans 16, 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 10. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom of God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. The mystery of the faith that... I find it odd that Paul used the word mystery uh, because it has been revealed. It has been revealed. Uh, Paul understands it. Timothy understands it. The, uh, uh, the church there where Timothy is, at least some of those folks understand it. The mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. I, I still don't understand what he means by that pure conscience. Has he laid out all things before God? Is he hiding something? Is he is he trying to fool somebody and not fit these qualifications? But let these also first be tempted, and then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. That not tempted, but tested. Let them also first be tested. Um. The idea is that Timothy is to personally select these these men as deacons. He's supposed to select the men as elders. Uh, later on, now, so let me go back just a second, John. You're okay. talking about the mystery of faith and good conscience here. You know, I think that's something that, again uh, every Christian can apply there. But it's understanding uh, as you read more about the Bible, understanding. The mystery is not a mystery anymore. It's a revealed process that right. God had in um, making known His Son ultimately to us, and uh, other things that have transpired in biblical history. 
Um, but it's a respect for that, I think, that the deacon has, uh, the revelation of, of, the, of the faith. And they, again, in holding a pure conscience means that they've, they've obeyed it, and they admire it and love it and uh, respect it for what it is, and uh, are, living, are living in accordance with it as best they can. You know, you, mm-hmm. you, your mom and daddy tells you to do something and you don't do it, and then you kind of have a guilty conscience about it maybe as a kid. You know, you're kind of not in a clear conscience with your parents with the revealed word that they have but in a very small way you can see that example so uh, the deacons again trying to, to live out uh, the revelation that they are are understanding and coming to know even better I guess you'd say right uh, that uh, the pure conscience there we talk about keeping the conscience clean and what have you well Paul persecuted Christians with a clear conscience mm. Uh, the conscience is only reliable if it's been programmed properly. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and I, let me look at something real quick. Uh, you know, some people, of course, don't have a conscience. This Bible explains uh, how they've seared it with a hot iron, as an example is. What we mm-hmm. You know, have uh, gone against uh, things that would be against uh, uh, the Word of God and, and the natural processes that a human would have, and they get to where they don't have any feelings or judgment about anything that God would right. have them have. The word pure comes from a Greek word uh, that means clean and pure, and under that, three uh, definitions or explanations. Number one, it's physically. Uh, physically pure, purified by fire, uh, or like a, a vine cleansed by pruning so it's fitted to bear fruit. Uh, number two, in a Levitical sense, it is clean, the use of which is not forbidden. It imparts no uncleanness. And then the third one, this is what I think Paul's talking about, is ethically, uh, free from corrupt desire, from sin and guilt, free from every uh, from every ad, a mixture of what is false or in genu- sincere, genuine, so you don't mix those two things up, uh, that it, which is blameless, that is innocent. And then here's what I find interesting, unstained with the guilt of anything. Now, how do we get reach, to the, reach the point of being unstained with the guilt of anything? Well, that's only through, through the blood of Christ. And that's one of these things that's going to help program that conscience in a, in a proper way. Uh, go back to my New King James. All right, let me first also be tested. Uh, again, Timothy is going to have to head pick these men. What way is he going? In what manner is he going to choose them? Well, Paul's already given him uh, the qualification for the elders and for the deacons, and it's up to Timothy to make the determination who's qualified. Well. I was sitting in the elders meeting uh, down at Homo one day and we were fixing to name some new deacons and the question came up, will this guy do what we ask him to do? And the, the, uh, the response from another elder was, well, let's give him a job and see if he'll do it. And I don't think that's what Paul's talking about here. Um, because if give him a job and let's see if he'll do it, Carrie, I'll need to take my name off the list. Because <laughs> uh, there's there's a lot of stuff that still needs to be done up here. All right, uh, let them serve as deacons be found blameless. All right, here we go. Shifting gears a little bit. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slander, uh, temperate, uh, faithful in all things. Their wives, let's see, come on, open up. Uh, it's suggested that uh, the wives here, the, the word could also have been uh, translated as women. Women mean meaning, uh, could mean deaconesses. Like in Romans 16 verse 1, uh, Phoebe was uh, named as a, a deaconess. 
but their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Well, it sounds like they need to be qualified to be deacons too, except that they're not married to a wife. All right. Let the hus- let the deacon be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. I've heard, well, I have heard over the years that in order to be a deacon, you got to have more than one kid. And I understand the Bill Cosby philosophy uh, about you know if somebody uh, breaks a vase in the house and you only have one kid, well, you know who did it. But if you have two, then you got to figure out. You got to use the wisdom of Solomon sometimes to figure out who did it. I understand what he's saying there. But to argue that deacons have to have more than one child because here uh, their children is plural, well, so is houses. Does he have to have more than one house? No, deacons is plural. So if this deacon has a child and this one has a child, they have children. Uh, For those who serve well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Um, Tim pointed out last week in his sermon that a deacon is not a junior elder, nor should he be. But he works in the, the physical aspect of the church under the oversight of the elders. Um, It's still something that has to be done. Um, It's because everything we do, and you ladies, I love the way y'all think of building up here. Y'all, I would like to give a round of applause. You stop and think about the physical aspects of the church. Well, what does vacuuming the carpet have to do with saving souls? Think about it. Well, it 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 doesn't in one aspect, but if I go and visit a church that's just dirty, filthy, and it hasn't been vacuumed in weeks, I might not be going back. You know, It, it could be that there's nobody who's physically able to take care of that. But guess what? We're looking at people here to do the physical things. Mm -hmm. Um, And talk about the really the organization of the church here, Mm -hmm. uh, which you know really drives home the point that um, people can get things done, but sometimes you need some kind of organization to implement it and have it happen. You know. Mm -hmm. God had to get him a Moses to go down to you know, plead the case of Israel down in Egypt and he with his right hand man Aaron and others you know had to help get those people to understand what they needed to do and move forward with it and try to help in the organization and there was a Levitical priesthood that came later you know in the, in the law uh, time when uh, they had tabernacle worship there was a lot of organization there and just worship to God, but uh, a lot of people say well, we don't we don't really need any you know elders or deacons to tell us what to do, and of course they're not there to tell you what to do in the sense they're meaning it, probably. right? But um, uh, you, you need to have certain people in place in order to get things done. Acts uh, pointed out as Tim did, the Grecian widows were being neglected mm-hmm. because of the. Uh, mixture of cultures and uh, not really seeing needs that had to be met so you know it it seems that God uh, uh, through the hand of Paul here to Timothy and on down uh, related to the fact that we need to work together to be organized in a way that we can do more for God I think Mm -hmm. he knew that we'd be more effective that way right and that makes total sense and that's it working together yeah yeah. So, mm-hmm. On the children bit there, you know, it's not completely clear that it's a requirement, but I think it's best that it would probably have more experience if someone did right. have children. Right. It's obvious. And, and it's whole, whole point is like with, with the elders, if he can't rule his own house well, then how's he going to take yeah. care of the church? Right. It's yeah. obvious that you know, if you have more than one child, you have right. more experience. 
Alright. I think that was the second bell. Mm -hmm. Good job.